introduction. Hi, I'm John Connolly uh, from Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory, and I'm here with Eugenie C. Scott from the National Centre for Science Education. Uh, Eugenie, I'm just going to ask you a few questions about evolution and about creationism. Um, and the first question I'd like to ask you is just about the theory of science, and detractors of evolution describe it sometimes as just a theory. Could you explain uh, what we mean when we say theory in the scientific community? That's a that is a question and a problem I run into all the time because the way scientists use the word sci theory and the, word, the way the general public uses the word theory are really very different. But there's enough of an overlap that you can kind of see where the, the confusion might come in. If you're just using the word like they use it on the street, theory is a guess or a hunch or something that is fairly unsubstantiated and you don't really want to pay it. That's your theory buster. Nobody really pays a lot of attention to that. The word theory in science is a term of art and it means a well-substantiated explanation of a phenomenon. So when you think about it, what scientists try to do is come up with theories. Theories aren't, aren't just these throwaway ideas. They're the goal of what science is all about. If you can come up with a theory as a scientist, you can die happy. This is really what it's all about. Theories are abstract um, uh, combinations of, of facts, of laws, of tested hypotheses, of minor theories. They're inferential explanations of natural phenomena. And as such, they're the goal of what we do and what science is all about. They're not guesses. Okay, so would you describe intelligent design as having the credentials to call itself a theory? Well, it all depends on what your definition of science is as to whether you accept intelligent design as science. Uh, intelligent design is fundamentally a religious explanation. It's, uh, as I've shown in some of my work, uh, articles and books that I've written and, and discussions I've had in studying this movement for such a long time, essentially it's a repackaging of an earlier idea called creation science. Um, it focuses on the uh, very real phenomenon that there's a lot of complexity in nature, especially in biology. We have really complicated things like the blood clotting cascade or uh, the, the little motor at, at the junction of a bacteria and a flagellum that, that moves it through the water. There's some really, really complicated things in biology. How do you explain them? Well, the intelligent design approach is to look at these really complicated things and say, it's too complicated to have a natural explanation. Some sort of intelligence had to have been involved in producing this complex structure, this complex process in the cell. Therefore, God did it. I mean, that, that's really the, the, the basis of what they're saying. It's not, we have evidence to show that um, special creation explains really complicated biological uh, structures. The argument is, on the contrary, Science can't explain these structures, therefore we win by default. And you know, nobody in their right mind wants to do science that way. Right, so what you're getting at here is the concept of irreducible complexity, presumably. That's one of the main concepts. In fact, it's in arguably the only real scientific, scientific component of intelligent design. This idea that uh, uh, in a structure like, uh, like the bacteria flagellum, which has kind of become the poster child for intelligent design, you've got about 50 proteins, about 50 components of this structure. And the claim is if you take even one of them away, uh, you've got, uh, you, you don't have a flagellum that works anymore. The motor doesn't work, the bacterium just lies there in the water and, and it's, it's downhill from there. Uh, that's, just, that's just empirically wrong. Um, you can take away lots of proteins and still get a functional uh, flagellum. Number one, uh, there's no such thing as the bacteria flagellum. There are lots of different flagella. And there's bacteria flagella, there's eukaryotic cell uh, fl flagella, there's lots of structures like flagella in, in nature. There's not a flagellum, and the model doesn't really work when you look at the whole range of stuff. But in, in a sense, the idea of irreducible complexity is, is, is kind of true by definition. You know, if I took enough parts of you away, you'd stop working, okay? So it, it's not that, uh, that it's impossible to think of something that at some level is irreducibly complex. But the problem with intelligent design is that they, they, want to, they want to argue that there's a whole class of phenomena in nature that we just take off the table for science to explain. Now, 
what scientist wants to say um, this is unsolvable? <clears throat> there, there's a lot of problems in nature. Uh, there's a lot of problems that scientists have that we haven't yet explained. But not yet having explained something doesn't make some, something unexplainable. And that's the mistake that the, crea that the uh, uh, intelligent design folks make. Right, so you spoke a little bit about flagella. The other um, argument that's always drawn up is the, is the, is the mammalian eye. Oh, and yes, that, again, the classic. That's too, okay. that goes back to the 1700s, really. Right, so yeah. could you maybe dispel that a little bit for us, um, that the, the idea that the eye is too complex mm -hmm. um, a system to have evolved, that it must have had some intelligence? You know, if you read the creationist literature, and I don't want to wish that on anyone, uh, but if you do, um, you'll find that they're very fond of uh, quoting a statement that Darwin made in On the Origin of Species, where I, and I haven't memorized it, but something like, and it is really quite preposterous to imagine that something like the vertebrate eye, and it's so snazzy, it, he, he didn't say snazzy, but you know, it's got all these parts that work together to bring light to the eye and form an image, and it's just, I'm sure it's just, and nobody would, would think it would be possible for my natural selection to produce this. And the creationists all say, see, Darwin himself says that the eye can't evolve. And, but they, they've never really looked at the book because they just keep quoting each other. And if you actually go to the origin of species, and you find that passage, and you continue reading it. He goes, the very next sentence is, but I can assure you that that's not the case, that I can do this. And then he goes on with this wonderful description of how, how it's quite possible to take a very simple structure and with very few modifications, uh, improve its ability to um, assist an organism. In other words, in Darwinian terms, in Darwin's own terms, it would have adaptive value. And he then does this wonderful thing of, of go, which Darwin did all his life, of course. He was a wonderful naturalist. He went out to nature and he looked at nature and said, you know, there's something that's kind of like what I'm talking about. And if you look at the eye of a snail, it's hardly more than just a slight, a, a slight pigmented spot on the on the uh, uh, surface of the skin there. But you know, having a, a having a pigmented spot does allow you to tell uh, light from dark. So that's adaptive to a snail. That, that would actually help a snail get along better. So any ancestral primitive snail that, or creature that had this light sensitive uh, spot uh, would, would be at an advantage. And so would you know, live longer and as we'd say today, pass on its genes more than, than a creature of the same species that didn't have that. And then he goes on and says, well, you know, here's, here's another kind of creature, another little invertebrate creature, uh, the limpet, that has that pigmented spot, but it also has kind of a little bit of an indentation on the skin where that pigmented spot occurs. And that's an advantage. That's actually better than that snail eye because having an indentation as well as that pigmented spot allows you to get an idea of what direction the light's coming from. So that's even better than being able to tell light from dark. And by the way, if you look at the physiology of this, being able to tell light from dark is useful for, an, for many creatures. I mean, lots and lots and lots of, of organisms, plant, uh, animals, for uh, setting the biological clock, so to speak, for certain physiological reactions that happen. Uh, being able to tell what direction the light is coming from is very useful because that might help you uh, uh, navigate for, uh, toward or um, toward food, for example, or away from heat or away from other kinds of phenomena that you might want to avoid or, or be attracted to. And then Darwin goes on and says, well, you know, the next thing you do, you, he finds another animal. And he points to it as, as having not only the, 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 you know, some wiring down here at the bottom and this cup-shaped thing, but, but actually um, the, the cup is formed almost to a, a, a pinhole. And it's kind of the equivalent of the old-fashioned pinhole cameras that you know, people had in the early 20th century. Nobody has them now, of course, because we've all gone far beyond that. But a pinhole camera is a big advantage over just having a cup because a pinhole camera uh, actually can allow an image to focus on the back of the eye. So anyway, he, he builds up the system step by step by step by step. And actually on NCSE's uh, website, we've got a little video talking about the evolution of the eye in the same fashion. And then you add an, a lens, and that that's an improvement as well. So. What Darwin does is look at the eye, the, the final product, the vertebrate eye, which is a very snazzy kind of organ. It's really good about getting images to the eye and getting that information to the brain. But he shows you how from very, very simple beginnings, there's an adaptive value to each step until you finally build up to the final product. 